Hi, friends. Hello, and welcome to what is a very special night, a night that I have been counting down the days to, and I know a lot of other people have as well. Tonight is the release of our very own Susie F. Garcia's chapbook, A Homegrown Fairy Tale. Um, I honestly could not be prouder to even be involved. Um, you know, uh, we know I met Susie through Sequester, but she's become one of my closest friends. And I'm so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very humbled to be able to be a part of this. And we have some great readers tonight. And of course, Susie herself um, to cap off the night. I am not going to uh, bog you down with me speaking for very long. I want to bring out um, our first guest of the night, um, poet, translator, essayist, editor, and San Francisco native, Francisco Aragon studied Spanish at the University of California at Berkeley and New York University. He earned an MA from the University of California at Davis and an MFA from the University of Notre Dame. Aragon currently directs Letras Latinas, the literary program of the Institute for Latino Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Um, Francisco Aragon. Buenas noches. My name is Francisco Aragon, and I direct Letras Latinas, the literary initiative at the University of Notre Dame's Institute for Latino Studies. In recent years, Letras Latinas aims to meaningfully involve our graduate students. For example, a few years ago, we hosted a mini conference featuring four Latinx poets. Among those who graced us with their presence was one of tonight's co-readers, Carmen Jimenez Smith co-editor of the anthology that inspired the conference, Angels of the Americlips. One of the highlights of those three days, at least for me, was witnessing the rapport that was forged between our guests and our MFA students. They were in charge of the formal introductions at the main event, and they were in charge of conducting the oral history video interviews that are online. Carmen, was interviewed by none other than Susie F. Garcia. Letras Latinas is thrilled to have a hand in tonight's launch of Susie's collection, A Homegrown Fairy Tale. For the closing reception of that Angels Conference, Susie graciously offered her apartment for what proved to be a cozy and memorable affair. I think she would agree with me when I say that those three days were a highlight of her time at Notre Dame. Letras, Letras Latinas' mission includes creating spaces to foster a sense of community among writers. One of the ways we strive to do this is by designating so-called Letras Latinas Fellows at literary gatherings off campus. Susie has been such a fellow on two occasions. One year, she and the poet Oliver Baez Bendorf were Letras Latinas Fellows at a Canto Mundo gathering. I recall with pleasure hosting a dinner in Manhattan so that Oliver and Susie could bond over a meal. Another time, Susie was a Letras Latinas Fellow at the Split This Rock Poetry Festival in Washington, DC. From the beginning, I had a sense that Susie's generous spirit would result in great things. Carmen will speak about Susie's gifts on the page. For now, let me say that off the page, Susie is a model literary citizen. She serves as an executive editor at Noemi Press, as well as the online editor at the Michigan Quarterly Review. In addition to being a Canto Mundo Fellow, she is a member of the Macondo Writers Workshop, and she was selected to participate in the first poetry incubator put on by the Poetry Foundation. For my part, I consider Susie a Letras Latinas associate, especially as it pertains to the Acrylica series, a joint publishing venture between Noemi Press and Letras Latinas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francisco. Um, we will now bring on our very own Charlie Reinhardt Jones. Uh, Charlie Reinhardt Jones is a recent graduate of Oberlin College where he studied political science, cinema studies, and creative writing. He currently works as an organizer for the Colorado Democratic Party. In his free time, Charlie writes and reads poetry. 
and podcasts for us here at Podquester Mini. Ladies and gentlemen, Charlie Reinhardt Jones. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm really grateful to be here, and I'm so proud of my friend Susie for all of her work, and I'm so excited to hear everyone today. Um, I, uh, you know, sometimes can feel a little bit out of my depth, but I'm really excited to, you know, share some some work with you. So um, this poem is called Stand Still. Um, yeah, and I'll read it now. Grass blades itch me. It bothers me from the conversation, which keeps stealing my attention briefly like a mosquito bite or sour candy does. I'm on my last legs, just waiting to get back to summer scalding bath water in the comfort of my bathroom. There's a church-shaped hole in my mind. In the desert of my mind, the worshipers there are lazy. They have exceptionally poor attendance. I've sweat through my clothes, sitting here with you and your friends of friends, and I'm not sure that we have much in common with them. Anybody says something about the weather or last week's news, Someone pays a compliment that could have been paid to anyone to me, and I thank them for it, but I can't pay attention because today's sermon is one about loyalty, and boy, am I listening. Better than any earplugs is a choir in your mind. Most of the other people in the church have their phones tucked under their Bibles like bookmarks, not me. I'm loyal like a dog. I'm loyal like the street light flickering. I'm loyal like a house plant that sits like a decoration to you. I wait every three days for attention from you. I mean, after all, you water me while you're on the phone. Your friends take care of me when you go on a trip, and I'm not sure you'll take me when you move away. After all, I almost ask you, why do we come to this place with these people? I'm not sure that we have much in common with them. They're the people who walk too briskly through the museum to be seen in a place where the purpose is to look, and I don't trust them. I almost ask you again, but I don't. And that's that poem. Yeah. And I'm going to read one more really short poem. And that's it. <laughs> um, this poem is called uh, Crescent. The most worthwhile sights that there are to see are just above the crescent of your rooftop. They happen when we're either fast asleep or just waking. Crystalline orange sunrises or deep indigo night skies that might not even be real, but the product of your naive, unadjusted eyes. You miss the true silence in the city and its beautiful interruptions, and you miss all of the end of those night shifts where the people are the most tired, but also the most blessed. Students chug Benadryl just to miss these things on time, and we miss them every day, just to dream of former classmates or lounge and reflect on the questionable choices of a crossword editor. Yeah, that's that poem. And those are the poems. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Nice. Okay. Um, next up, uh, Marcelo Hernandez Castillo is a poet, essayist, translator, and immigration advocate. He is the author of Senzant Lay, which was chosen by Brenda Shaughnessy as the winner of the 2017 A. Poland Junior Prize, published by BOA Editions in 2018, as well as the winner of the Great Lakes Colleges Association New Writer Award for Poetry, the 2019 Golden Poppy Award from the Northern California Independent Bookseller Association, and the Bronze in the Forward Indie Best Book of the Year. Sinzantle was also a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award, the California Book Award, the Publishing Triangle's Tom Gunn Award for Gay Poetry, and the Northern California Book Award. Sinzantle was listed among one of NPR's and the New York Public Library's top pick of 2018. His first chapbook, Dulce, won the Drinking Gourd Poetry Prize published by Northwestern University's Press. His memoir, Children of the Land, was published by HarperCollins in 2020. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Marcelo Hernandez Castillo. Hi, everybody. Congratulations to Susie um, for her uh, book. I can't wait to um, for everybody to have it in their hands. I'm going to be reading just a brief section from my um, memoir. Um, Yes. Um, sorry. Uh, 
Um, okay. I wish I, I highlighted the wrong part, <laughs> as always. Um, okay, yeah. There was a time when I believed in repetition, when I thought repetition meant things would be simple, predictable. Maybe then, when nothing changed, when all the variables were accounted for, I could move through the world in a way I had never moved through it before. How I imagined mostly everyone else made it through their day intact. Um, sorry, intact. I lost my word. Intact, aware of what time, day, or month it was. If I drew the same circle a thousand times, I was certain I would see something different about the things around me. Once, when my anxiety was so great that I thought my skin would actually peel off my body, I went out for a walk on a warm evening in California. I found myself in an empty parking lot beneath the largest moon I had ever seen. I sat down and stared until the moon started making faces at me. Yes, actual faces. They would appear and disappear and move in circles. I sat there for what seemed like hours, not blinking once and just letting my tears keep my eyes from closing, joyfully weeping. I walked back to my mother's house and counted the steps it took to get there. I wanted to record exactly what I had done to repeat it for the next day. I wanted that feeling to last forever, and I was afraid that any small change would scare it away. I couldn't remember the last time I, was tr I wasn't trembling with anxiety. Repetition as sustained attention made me pick up my body, walk home, and tell my mother I loved her in Spanish. It was so simple. I didn't even need a pen or paper to draw the moon. Just trace it with my eyes. I once read a book on Alberto Giacometti and his ritual of painting people's portraits. He would spend weeks painting over the same face, so much that the layers would start to clump. He would chisel away, polish, and start again. Can you hear me okay? He said he felt like, where was that? Um, he said he felt like he was looking into a hole, something he could not see completely to the bottom. Was the hole in the face? Uh, was the hole in the face he was staring at or in the canvas he was painting on? I wonder if he was looking for the right version of the same face, the one that few people knew existed. And in the end, you could tell there was something there behind the lines and scratches. You could tell that there was more than just a face, the emotion distilled behind the face. He always managed to find the right one. Somehow he captured the sadness of his lover, his friends or acquaintances. It could never happen, have happened on the first try. It took him hundreds of attempts before he would be certain that he'd painted something worthwhile. All the while his models stood still, their hands folded on their laps, looking at his frustrated expression. He wasn't interested in perfection, only in the process of getting there. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. All right, next up, uh, Moon Abdullahi is an award-winning Somali-American black Muslim woman, national spoken word poet based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She was ranked the eighth woman poet in the world from the 2018 Women of the World Poetry Slam competition, as well as a three-time Minnesota Grand Slam champion. Her work has been published, featured in a Harvard Advocate, Button Poetry, Minnesota History Museum, Star Tribune, and more. In her work, she explores many themes of belonging and identity, particularly in the context of migration and nationality. As a writer and poet, Muna pushes herself to tell the stories that are erased, silenced, devalued, or buried, the stories that are difficult, the stories that bring together communities, youth, and discussions. Muna Abdullahi. Thank you, Louis. Um, I'm so, so excited. I don't know about y'all, but this so far has been so beautiful and it's just gonna get better. Big congratulations to Susie um, on this beautiful, beautiful book. Um, one thing I do wanna say real quick is, Ooh, okay, so one thing I really wanna say is, so I'm a spoken word poet, which means I am someone who very much so enjoys speaking poetry. Um, and so this right here is something that I'm really, really enjoying. and. Um, but here's the thing, before I usually do a poem in front of an audience, I do this recite and recall. As you can see, I'm the only one, you know, in this vicinity, but I think 
in itself, I still want to do it. It's, it's a way I ground myself and I hope I, it can ground y'all too. So I want y'all to repeat after me in your room, wherever you're at, just repeat after me. If you're in public, you know, maybe a little like a little small little noise. I don't know. But here we go. I am alive. Therefore, this space is alive. Again, I am alive. Therefore, this space is alive. Okay, okay. I feel like the energy's here. The energy's here. So I'm hoping y'all y'all did that recite and recall. Okay, so the poems I'm gonna be doing is poems that I feel uh is something that I personally relate with Susie in the sense of being a uh, daughter of immigrants. And a lot of my a lot of my poetry in itself is centered around identity, is centered around, you know, being both um Somali and American. And so these two pieces I'm gonna be performing is is centered around home. And so this first one is five confessions of home. I have snuck past the borders of another mouth today, made an accent sound like kinship and watched myself drown in false comfort of home. Growing up, the question, where are you from, was always a game of multiple choice, where the person asking the question was also the person who had the answer key. Uh, there is always a countdown when a Somali stranger realizes that I'm fluent in my mother's tongue, yet wasn't born on the land of the mother who taught how to move that tongue. When they say, yes, you look East African, but where are you really from? Where they say, yes, you came out of your African mother, but you did not come out of your African motherland. So where are you really from? Where are you really from? Where are you really, really from? I contain so much sad African mouth that I can't even pronounce Goodyear while I man shine without a stranger examining the air it took to learn it too. Since I never knew my mother's home, I looked for belonging in stories. I've worn so many of my family's stories, I confuse my childhood for theirs. I tell myself it's not lying if I feel something and I, and I feel something, so I can't be lying if I feel something and I feel it. Since I never knew my mother's home, I looked for a belonging in language because I knew at a young age an accent is just one language haunting the other. And I was afraid of being visited by ghosts I would need a translator for. Was afraid God would have listened to my mother's pray praying for me in a language I would need a translator for. So I made sure to stretch my tongue longer than my mother's enough to cross the Atlantic Ocean, Ocean twisted it into three East African languages to reach the home of at least one of my ancestors because how dare I love a word without knowing it in Somali. Became a translator at the age of five, but I should have known better. No matter how many languages I learn, I have an accent in every language. How the translator has always just been the bridge, never the home. Just because a bridge crosses between two borders doesn't mean it has an accent, has an access to both lands just a gateway to reach the other, never to be reached, never to be honed, but I should have known better. What is the point of speaking four languages if all it does, it gives me more ways to say other, to remember my own name, but more ways to say outside of it. Home is a place in time. With parents who are forced to leave makes me the girl who only has stories and languages to inherit. To be displaced by land is to be displaced between families, constantly questioning if the diaspora made my family or if it made loneliness. I'm not from here, I'm not really from anywhere. Reclaiming home has never been about reclaiming home because to reclaim the diaspora is to claim being some type of foreign everywhere. Reclaiming home has never been about reclaiming home. Where I'm from is where I'm from and not where you say I'm from, reclaiming home, has ever been about reclaiming home, but reclaiming me. Speaking all of me into a cup, speaking Somali, Habisha, Swahili into one sentence, not to communicate with others, but to communicate with myself. 
to remind myself I'm home. I'm home. I am home. That is the first poem. Um, the second piece I'm going to be doing is a piece I love. Uh, let me find it real quick. As I find this real quick, if you haven't already and you're watching this, go ahead. Go ahead and get Susie's book. Okay, y'all, we are about to be graced by Susie shortly after. And y'all, y'all, by the time we get there, y'all better have pre-ordered the book already. Ordered it. Boom block, period. All right, so this piece is called The Unwritten Letter from My Immigrant Parents. Dear daughter, when you came up to me at five years old and told me you wanted to be just like me when you grew up, parents are usually filled with joy. But me, my heart dropped to the floor because I wasn't the daughter I couldn't bear to tell you at five years old, I wasn't. Dear daughter, I pray to God every day you don't experience what it's like to be me. How it feels to work endless hours day in and day out and spend endless nights trying to learn a language that doesn't even know how to pronounce you correctly. That tells you to go back to a country many died to escape from. My daughter, I did not bring you here to be anything like me. I brought you here for a reason. My daughter, the reason I pushed you to be a doctor or a lawyer isn't because of the money. It was never about the money. It's because we live in a system that expects nothing but less from you. So in this household, I expect everything but less from you, my daughter. You are called first generation for a reason. It is because the American dream was never meant for me. It was always, always meant for you. So my daughter, take our culture and our native tongue and speak, learn, jump, fail, fall, speak, learn, jump, fail, fall, and get back up, my daughter. The best of me lives inside of you. So speak. Thank you all. Thank you, Susie, for having me again. Y'all, tonight is going to be a great show. It's been going a great show. I'm so excited for everything else that's in store. Thank you all again. Louie, you're on mute. Uh, Carmen Jimenez Smith is a former Guggenheim fellow and the author, author of a memoir and six poetry collections, including Milk and Filth, a finalist for the 2013 National Book Critics Circle Award in Poetry, and Bee Recorder, a finalist for the National Book Award and the Penn Open Book Award. She was awarded an American Book Award for Bring Down the Little Birds and the Juniper Prize for Poetry for her collection Goodbye Flicker. She acts as the publisher of Nomi Press and the director of the Virginia Tech MFA program. Carmen Jimenez. Hi. I'm really, really excited to be celebrating Susie's work um, tonight, and, and I'm honored to be reading alongside her and um, the other readers. I, I am gonna read three short poems. Uh, I'm eager to get to Susie's work. Uh, so I've got, these are very new. Um, I don't know that much about them. They're, they're love poems. This one is called Hot Second. We all ruin our lives differently and that's 
fine. We're just doing life. Our whole life seems sorted out each time we look in the mirror and think we're seeing ourselves. Take a picture of yourself, cut it in half, duplicate those halves and you have two faces. In both faces, buried homo desire. Move the mirror out of the room to become the story of a shipwrecked wife falling in love in an Italian restaurant by the lick of a candle. She hardly knows it yet, just on the edge. Sometimes love inspires a wholesale of returning. One day I imagined the body I could be having forced my hungers into a box. That's what duty does. Then shudder, then implosion, then the hue of all of your mouths. That's what lust does. Who says lust anymore? The lustful. Geography as swerving. Allegorical and remote, the gold of your North Dakota is scenic brown as your clavicle swoop, the miracle of the Big Bang leading to roses and lips. The could have happened, the almost happened, the did happen. You were you late one night against a fire, the getting was for me. A gust of desire untwined past like something fluid. Are there rivers in North Dakota? When I rise, it keeps coming back like it was a ceremony, that portent. I hadn't known where you were from, perhaps nothing about you. What a risk. I rose, the best of me. I sent wavelengths to pulse in the earth like a heartbeat to you. Then I went. We yesed carefully. I couldn't remember your voice. I wondered when we would come back to that which becomes this, which becomes axis. Uh, this one doesn't have a title yet, um, and I actually, it was two poems that I just clipped it, and then, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, it's got a title that's stupid. It's called Chapter One. You don't start a love story with gutted, but that's where I'll start, rent in a bed in a hotel in a college town. The room is a blue chintz dream of mine, like the scene of showing up to an affair in a coast, East Coast beach town in the off season. When I find myself looking for a gif online that means feeling banished to a remote corner of your heart, I know I'm in trouble, the size of a flea without your regard. I register each wavelength from your voice for the fate of you. I'm green enough to be a believer, but I'm not. Still, I feel close when the lamp says, and for once in your life, can you be honest with yourself? I sleep inside layers of din, a radiator, the dog, my teenager asking for car keys. I am me, the future about me, more specifically, first, my best end. I'm going to, um, I'm going to introduce Susie. Uh, and uh, I'm very excited to do that. But I want to begin with um, a shout out to Crystal for bringing this uh, review uh, out, this book out, be, uh, because of the how Susie's previous publisher failed her. Um, we're so lucky for the feminist coalitions who build uh, spaces around radical and uncategorizable poetry uh, and I'm thankful for Crystal and other folks for stepping up to support um, Susie's book, which is so vital. Susie F. Garcia is the author of the chapbook, A Homegrown Fairy Tale, published by Bone Bouquet. The daughter of a Peruvian immigrant, she has an MFA in creative writing with minors in screen cultures and gender studies. Susie is an executive director at Noemi Press, where she has worked with authors such as the Blunt Research Group, Jennifer Tamayo, Roberto Tejada, Thierry Mient, and Vanessa Villarreal. In addition, she is the online editor for the Michigan Quarterly Review. Susie is a Canto Mundo Fellow, a Macondista, and participated in the first ever poetry incubator at the Poetry Foundation. She currently serves at the Canto Mundo Regional Chair for the Midwest and on the steering committee for the organization's new vision. Her writing has been featured or is forthcoming from Poetry Magazine, The Offing, Vinyl, Fence Magazine, and others. 
She has presented at PCA, ACA, AWP, and Consoling Passions, among other national conferences. Susie is also one third of PodQuester Mini, which covers reality TV and online gaming, specifically Sequester. She co-hosts Brown Girl Breakdown with Sharifa Yasmin to discuss race, gender, and sexuality on reality TV. You can find them on YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter. Susie is a vital force in all her endeavors, a phenomenal advocate for Latinx poetry who radically challenges her subjectivity and her commitment to radical allyship. She has a dense knowledge of popular culture, which she synthesizes with her critical knowledge about how other bodies are constructed and projected upon. Susie's a queen. Her poems exude glitter, Lisa Lisa, and femme drama. Her aesthetics are the colors of Max Selena La Reina limited edition lipstick line. She is Arkansas and Peru, and her work plums deep into the body's griefs and whims. Susie is also a consummate editor who can peer into any book's abyss and find the lights. Her editorial practice is always informed by her commitment to social justice, so her editorial process enacts an important accountability. I don't put poems in the world without her hands on them. I don't think many po people who work with her would either. There's nothing Susie Garcia can't do. Beloved, admired, she represents what's beautiful about advocacy, about feminism, and about art. Some of your favorite Noemi books live in their form because Susie walked alongside of them. I've been lucky, too, to read her full-length collection, Tenderheaded, and I can't wait till you get to read it, too. Here's an excerpt from the book's first poem, a way for me, for me to really introduce you to her work. It's called On the Bus Ride from Arkansas to Michigan, The Window Frames Me, and I'm just going to read a short section of it. One, sugar straight from the bag buries me from the inside out. Tonight I travel, a Selena Gomez sad song on repeat. I float on Arkansas cotton fields where a lightness brings me down under the cold moon I call mother. Two, I create static hands through hair. I create electricity. I, three, day dawns and my mouth has grown over like a scar across raw, red, and unsightly but I broke all my mirrors before I left home anyway. Four, marble crumbles. I'd rather be kept in bones, mutating. Five, I see a kitchen table in every tree and a lighthouse in every musical rest. Six, a stranger on the bus told me to smile and my friend texted, well, you do cry too much. Out the window, the moon teaches me patience, waits her turn. My death would not complete anything, but maybe it could be a beginning. I count out centuries until the next stop. The chapbook she'll be reading from tonight is a tornado within a tornado, an occupation of the Wizard of Oz's Dorothy story set in a weird 21st century Bible Belt town where a speaker yearns for the transformative, transformative decadence of Oz. I'm thrilled, ecstatic, and honored to introduce Susie Garcia tonight. Um, thank you so much, everybody. I am overwhelmed. I think we should all be proud of me for not crying, um, but I am I'm overcome. I really am. I am so thankful to each of you for reading to Louis for hosting, to Francisco for his introduction, um, to everyone in the comments and who, and endlessly thankful to Carmen. Uh, Carmen is my, my mother, my poetry mother, but she is also my mentor. She is also my friend. And I am so lucky to be in the world with these people, um, both on screen and off screen. I cannot say enough about how grateful I am to all of you. Um, I do also want to give a huge shout out to Crystal, who totally slayed this book, who came in, was my knight in shining armor um, to pick up this book when 
you know, it was given six weeks to find a new home. Um, and she completely made it work. And I'm so grateful to her. I'm grateful to Sarah who designed my cover. Um, I'm grateful to Let's Others Latinas, who, which has always been a haven for me at Notre Dame, as well as the gender studies department. Um, those were two spaces that really allowed me to get in touch with who I am and what I want to write about. And a lot of these poems were created during my time in those spaces um, and were influenced by the conversations I had there. Um, so I'm so grateful to all of you. I'm so sorry that Derek couldn't be with us tonight. He had an event that ran over, but I mean, I guess that means Derek and I will have to do another reading together. Um, Derek was actually one of the first people who told me to publish these poems out in the world. Uh, he suggested I publish them with the offing when the offing um, first came about. And that was the first home that some of these poems found their way into. Um, I'm so grateful to all the editors too that, that took a chance on these little weird poems about that are just basically like, I'm here, I'm queer, Dorothy Gale made me this way. Um, <laughs> I also, of course, have to give a big shout out to D.A. Powell, who wrote the blurb for the back of the book. Uh, he has always been a generous and kind um, teacher and supporter of mine. And thank you to everyone. It's so exciting to see all of the names in the chat. Uh, Roberto, Joshua, Sarah, Rigoberto, Emily, Geneva, Oliver. I, I mean, obviously, I can't say everyone's name, but I really appreciate that every everyone's here from such different walks of my life to celebrate me. I cannot tell you what it means to me. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is, I have invested. I have invested in Oz and Sankerment and waterproof mascara. Technicolor is kept in your pockets and I am scouring the country for a taste. My fingernails are torn and bloody as I search dirt for Silver shoes create maps of absence. On my skin, I ink silence with safety pins, tricks I learned in my youth that still hold me over. Loneliness is not the end, and I have the scars to prove it on my thighs. After all, life is finite, and that might be the last hope I have. Um, the next poem I'm going to read is A Dream, A Gale. I was the middle, where the southern and northern winds met, where the house still stood an inexact center. We were torn apart at the last moment, darling, and our joints unhinged. The wind was a violence that whipped my hair, and when we settled, we did not get all the right parts. My hand has never moved like the water again, a freckle on your nose I'd never seen before. This was not a condemnation. I felt blessed. In Oz, we prism blur borders become stateless. Dorothy, you are the last of the miracles. Breathe out, gilded air. I started for California, made a stop at the first place there was water. I received word that there was gold left in Hollywood, but it wasn't there. Not for me, not for you. Dorothy, it doesn't matter. We can go full burlesque if you want, a show in Vegas every night until you're ready to return to Oz. There are lights on the strip too, Dorothy. Um, this poem Francisco uh, asked for, so um, this is your permanent permutation. Um, I should learn how to write, say the words that I write, but small detail. <laughs> mirror permutation there was a knife sharp pain when we were brought together can it be replicated no but it can be dulled a needle into my flesh a new mask for my face I wake up in the dark and my mouth is dry a taste in the back of my throat like artificial cherry people surround me to talk about the soul but I'm surfing for the next couch there was a Barcelona we never tried, a cool grass kiss in front of La Sagrada Familia. Your mouth moves and curves and laughs, but Dorothy static sits on your tongue, and I know I have lost you again. Okay, 
This one is called Summer. I'm dragging veins in poison water, looking for my own face in oil spills, but there is no hope in the muddy, muddy mountaintops I try to call home. Together, we shook off the concept of civilization, find a numbness to pain and lips on hips and the sweet dew frozen in our hair. At night, I remember promises for mutiny. But now there's a blue filter over everything and summer presses on me. August is too late for bravery and I know I can't breathe through September this year. I stain my mouth in wine, leave my lips on each bar from ocean to ocean. I press the summer back, take the night into my teeth and I chew it up, swallow. Homesick. I see it in my dream still when I think I've pushed it out of my mind. Winds that bellow me, I see the color of the Mississippi, all mud and leaves and a way out. A storm blew in and I am joyful in defiance, standing at the window, my cheeks cut by blowing debris until finally I close my eyes against the dirt that comes at my face. Buried in my own home, I feel the comfort of weight on my chest, warm knowledge that something finally makes sense. I am young in my dream, and I don't mind the noise that builds until finally my ears fill and burst and find the silence I've been seeking for years now. But I've turned my back on the winds, and I'm trying to find a patch on earth instead. I read backwards. Search for the right map, the right prayer. Is there only desperate sadness and a loneliness that echoes in my joints at night? A throbbing in my finger bones and the, in the cold, I can barely clutch the steering wheel. Instead, I sit in a parking lot and sing along with the radio until my voice cracks, fails, falls. I am not just song, but in togetherness, we are song. And at church, I sing and half a duet. The choir answers in a version of your voice. Religion splinters and splits. Some churches out east have even turned art gecko. And those are where I wear an empire waist. Drink in the back of, chew, of cues instead. And my holy water is gin. Herbs in line and an extraterrestrial green. Sometimes I think I can be more than martyr. I can let go of this monopoly on sorrow. Then someone hands me pills outside a sacred space and I burn through every emotion I know. I turn up the volume on the radio and I drown out in stereo. Um, okay, this one is, I am itching to ruin my reputation. Uh, I pop my gum in the back of churches, start wearing big jewelry again, anything but emeralds. Yes, in Oz, we were dangerous, but isn't that what made us invisible? Dorothy, we were supposed to be orphans together, but stuck here on earth, I apply too much perfume, leave rooms and wastes of musk, roots, pepper, cloves, and saffron. My hair is teased to touch sky and my lips peel back in a curl. Can't no one stop me now. Oh, no. I cut my own tongue on the sharpness of my canine, suck the blood loudly, smear it across my chin, tapping my nails on the wood of pews. I create my own psalms. I am sacrament. I am sin. I am begging them to cast me out. Um, I think this, yeah, okay, two more poems. A Before Time. Once we were warm hands and unrelenting heat until dark, and then we glowed, became an independent space station. Life began in our laughter, Dorothy. I now know that it was a no man's land, but that's all I'm asking for. We knew there were high notes out of reach, yet that didn't stop us from trying when it was just you, me, prairie gas. I saw a movie last night, a story that flickered across my face in the dark, pretending that there are framed fantasies that satisfy, but it ended and I was empty again. 
So I sat in my car alone, turned the bass up to blur out words, drinking whiskey. I now understand a different burn. Not the kind we had under Kansas skies, a crisp warmth on our skin that sink in. The one that starts in my stomach and throat, moves to the blood, and I can almost feel my fingers. A bottle kiss instead, and I scratch your name out in notebooks again and again. Forget that I might hate you. Write another prayer in mislaid symbols. I am growing older, though I never believed that would happen to me. I saw a church doctor who said I didn't drink enough water. I spend too much time at the beaches, I'm told, getting as dark as the earth I hate. I rejected my own mother, the one who doesn't recognize me. But now I've come back, molding myself into a twin of her. Rough and dark, a sculpture of what she and I could have been, and I'm paying the price. Those little marks at the corner of my mouth and eyes pull my face down, and there's no lipstick bright enough to hide. The time is going on without me. Um, and then the final poem I'm going to read is confession. Yeah, confession. I admit it. There are things I haven't escaped. I run in an airport, even though it doesn't matter if I miss my flight. No one waits for me in the next city or the next or the next. Crossing state lines, I am pooled. I know I could find a home, ancient and physical, in the Amazon, among treetops and temple sites, but I have discovered folklore and myth are natural. As natural as falling into sleep under poppies, as love between you and me, we have become historical. We are the old story, now fresh. Remember the sunsets? I hide them in the forest. I, they have seen the birds flee the loneliness. They know what is in my heart. Thank you all. This is, it's always weird to read virtually. Um, I think that if anyone has any questions that Louie and I are happy, okay. <laughs> this is what happened when Louie and I both <laughs> control things. But I do want to say salute to Los Todos for, and to say thank you so much to everyone who both came and um, who bought and who read and just everyone involved. Everything uh, in my life is about community. Um, Hola, Rico Beto. Um, and I am so lucky to have you all in my life. Um, yeah, I, I'm really trying not to cry tonight. <laughs> That's my goal. Um, so if there are any questions, I am happy to answer those. It was so beautiful, Susie, and it was so, I will, I will not make Thank you cry, you. so I won't say too much, but it was. Okay, um, yeah, Louis, you yeah. really know how to make me cry. Yeah, I, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will avoid that. <laughs> um, yeah, so please, any questions in the chat for Susie um, about this awesome chat book? I actually, I actually do have a question while we're waiting for questions from the chat. I am curious about the Dorothy Gale connection and, you know, how that came to be and how that resonated with you and how you you know, started writing about that. Oh my gosh, you um, came at me hard. Uh, my <laughs> it's my favorite movie. <laughs> Next to Garden State, that and Garden State. Oh, I know, please, let's not get into that right now. <laughs> um, so The Wizard of Oz was always my favorite movie, but I always thought it was like interesting how much she missed home. But home seemed to kind of suck. Um, and then I was big into the books. Um, I have some of the books like, behind me. Um, I've read, you know, a lot of different versions of all of the books. Um, my partner got me this amazing critical version, the annotated version. Um, I have an amazing, like, pop-up version. But I've read all the books. And I always thought it was the attitude of Dorothy and everything is very um, interesting because she loves very hard, but she also is really stuck in these versions of reality where she's just like, oh no, one of these people is, one of my friends um, is called the hungry tiger because he likes to eat babies, but he has a conscience. So he doesn't eat the babies. Um, <laughs> so that is, so I always found like these contrasts of emotions really interesting. But I also just love this idea of this perfect land where everything kind of works out, but is still super weird. Um, and it still is super dangerous. People die all the time there. 
But for Dorothy, everything works out. And then it had this beautiful um, feminine, like maternal ideas behind it too. We had Glinda and all of this beautiful art deco, long dresses. We had Ozma who um, was the queen of Oz and who was, they were all young. That was a lot of the part of it. Dorothy and Ozma were both very young, but very powerful and wise. Um, so I kind of fell in love with those characters too. Uh, there was a um, an army that marches that's made of only women. So these fantastic like conversations um, are, so, are so interesting to me that between women and like this fantastical moment, but it's so led by women. Um, so I think that for me, it was this fantasy of childhood, but also queerness. Um, and then I don't understand why she goes home at the end. And eventually in the books, she doesn't go home. She ends up living in Oz and she actually brings her family to Oz. But this idea of going home and how disappointing home must be about it is kind of the impetus to a lot of these um, questions I had about Dorothy. So we have a question from Bran in the chat. What kind of poetic style do you take inspiration from? Um, I think poetry wise, I really am drawn to confessional poetry and Sexton is my jam. I have that little reference to her about, um, she has a poem and you'll see like when it's, if you have poets in your timeline every June, um, it says June is, uh, it June, what is it? It's June and it's too late for bravery or something like that. Um, and I'm sure somebody will remind me. Let's see. And um, I um, I think that that is one of the biggest inspirations, but obviously Carmen is. I think it's really funny to listen to me and Carmen read back to back. Uh, I don't know if I've ever done that before. Um, and I see the biggest differences in our poetry. I'm very narrative. I think that comes a lot from, yes, I used to read a lot of narrative poetry, but I also now, I've also grew up reading a lot more stories and books um, that were novels. So I think you also see the narrative style of my poetry as well. So TR asks, what piece took the most out of you to write? It's really hard to answer because I think a lot of the poems were rewritten and remixed. Um, Carmen is always a fan of just cutting up your poems and putting them back together uh, to see which ones pass. Probably the final poem, which I didn't read, was one of the hardest ones to write because I didn't feel finished. I'm not 100% sure that I am finished with the book um, still, but there's a point when you have to say, I can't live in this one space anymore uh, and I have to move on. So I think finding an ending was really hard for me and I had to accept it. Um, FYI, y'all, she dies at the end. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> Um, so Braden asks, in confession, what was the sunset meant to be? The way it was almost personified just got to be. Oh my gosh. I'm trying to remember who this was. It's um, the editor of Fairy Tale Review. Carmen, you might remember her name. I can never remember her name. Uh, uh, gosh, what is her name? Anyway, she came to Notre Dame. And she was talking about fairy tales and she was talking about how in fairy tales, sometimes you would just be like, oh, and then this happened. And um, six years later, you noticed that. And that was really something interesting to me to think about how time passes. And when I think about what watches us as time passes, I think about um, nature. I think about, you know, the earth that is witness to everything, especially this is a very lonely journal. So we have to think about, yes, Kate Bernheimer. Thank you, Hannah, who just reminded me. Yes, it was Kate Bernheimer who um, said that. And so thinking about like fairy tales in the activation of the nature around them, as well as how that connects to our own realism and the nature around us watching. Here's a fun one from Roberto in the chat. Susie, a homegrown fairy tale is optioned in Hollywood. Who stars and who directs? 
Um, Ugh, Roberto. Of course, Roberto would ask the hardest questions. Um, I would say, I would want you to direct Roberto Tejada. You have the best, like, you and Bruno, my partner, have the best, like, knowledge of film and art of anybody I know. So I'd want y'all to co-direct. Um, and then I think I'd want maybe FK Twigs to star um, and also co-direct because she has amazing aesthetics that also remind, that are super femme and super aggressive in ways that make sense to me and super abstract. So I think those would be the, the ideas. Absolutely. Yeah, it would be super experimental. <laughs> I mean, I, I have done videos for it um, for past readings, but <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I just want FK Twigs to do everything in my life, right? <laughs> um, from Red Lego, what keeps you motivated to write? Oh, I'm terrible. Um, Carmen, Carmen, like, constantly texting me being like, did you write a poem today? Did you write a poem yesterday? Um, <laughs> um, actually, Doug, D.A. Powell, who wrote my blurb a few years ago, I was in a class with him and he was like, not everybody writes every day. You can write for a little while and then sort of um, stop for a little while and come back. It's okay to write every two weeks, but I think it's important to be cognizant every day. And that includes writing notes, having like moments where you are considering projects or thoughts or words or emotions. So um, I think part of what motivates me to keep writing is Carmen kicks my butt. And also the, like we just live in a world where I don't want to stop being in touch with my emotions. I don't want to stop being somebody who is caring um, and a lot of my processes go through writing. Um, if y'all think I'm emotional now, you should see me when I'm not writing. <laughs> like, then what? Then you would just get all of my emotions all the time. How terrible would that be for most of you? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Fred Lego. Um, any other questions in the chat? I will, I'll throw out one more question because I'm always kind of interested and we've talked about this a little bit, kind of like the, the dichotomy of like, you know, your poetry world and the weird wacky world that we're in now of like sequester and stuff and how that kind of translates and stuff. Have you found that one has impacted the other at all or not really particular? Um, let's see. I was telling you before I came on that like my students were like, Susie, I like your background. You look like a podcaster or like a YouTuber. And I was just like, oh, uh, yeah, I do that sometimes. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to talk about it, um, which is my answer. Like 90 percent of the time when poets ask me about sequester, I'm like, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, but I, you know, I don't think I'll know how it impacts it until like a year from now, because I think I process things a little slowly and it takes me a while to understand how they affect one another. I certainly think that people in my lives affect me. Um, and so people in sequester will affect me in that way. Uh, I think that, um, you know, I'm super excited to be part of this community. And I think that there are a lot of exciting um sub communities here too, you know, they're like queer people of color groups, there are women of color groups, there's a lot of conversations that I'm having um, where people are introducing me to new ideas and new readings and stuff like Sharifa and I talk about plays sometimes. Um, so those kind of like, those kind of conversations that push at my knowledge and the um, emotional um, connections that I'm making with people, I think will probably be the most influential, but I'm interested, of course, to see. Maybe I'll make a poem that's actually a game of sequester, like a wheel, a <laughs> poem that's a wheel. <laughs> that's actually like not completely out of the realm of something I would do. <laughs> so I'm we'll see. Excited I'm for super that. excited. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I've said that before too. I think it brings you know, you bring poetry to a lot of other people too, who may not be experienced in that before. I mean, certainly for me, like I wasn't as informed about poetry until I met you. So I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, any last questions from the chat? 
All right. Any final words from you? Yeah, I just, I mean, like, I can't say thank you enough to everybody who's been involved and everybody who's here tonight. Um, I am so buoyed by community and to see everyone here who, um, I don't know, I just feel like I love to give to people. And so when people connect back with me, it makes me feel so happy. And I feel like y'all bring so much to my life. Um, and I failed at not crying. But <laughs> thank you all for bringing so much to my life and for being with me during these moments. Absolutely. And you bring so much joy to all of us every day. And I'm, I'm so thankful to know you. And I know everybody in the community is as well. Um, if you have not, as of yet, please go and pick up a copy of A Homegrown Fairy Tale. I cannot wait to get my hands on it and have it and read it myself. Um, but until next time, should we still go out with the with the catchphrase? We'll see you out there. See ya. We'll see ya. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Bye.